Hello guys, I am the 19th Dogo and this is my first review, so I hope you guys like it. And yes, I know I am late to the party with this game, but luckily a lot of stuff has been added since it first came out, so at least that will make this review quite different than most. In this review I will mostly talk about the gameplay, since that's the most important aspect of this game in particular because its narrative at first it seems like an old school beat em up. Not to say that there is no story of that it is bad, it is just that at first glance it might seem overly simplistic, and sometimes intentionally unclear, but that's because a lot of it, it is not explained directly in the cutscenes. To fully understand what's going on, you must find some collectible items that serve as lore dump for the world building and character backstories. The quick summary is that a group of bad guys killed your father. Then one of them kills you, but you somehow come back to life thanks to a magic charm. So now you have to avenge him by tracking down all the main people who were involved in his murder. The main thing about this game is that, just like in this story, your character comes back to life after dying, but he does in exchange of time, which means that every time that he comes back from death he becomes older, so there's a limit of how many times you can come back to life, and this limited amount of lives is all that you have to clear the game, no more and no less. Also becoming older reduces your health and you cannot become younger. Every time you die, a death is added to your death counter. The more you have, the more years that you will age each time you die. For example, if you are at age 20 and you die once, you will only age to 21, because you only have one death so far. But if you die at, let's say, age 33, and you have now 3 deaths in total, you will age to 36. So yeah, you will have to remember some math for this. <laughs> this means that the more accumulated deaths that you have, the faster you will age each time you die, getting closer to your limit. So to reduce your death counter, you must do really good feats in the level, like beating a bunch of enemies or just one that's very strong. However, becoming older does have its advantages, like dealing more damage. Also, with each death you can purchase new skills by using the XP points that you have earned until that point by beating enemies. These skills are going to be very useful in your future battles, so you must choose carefully which ones you are going to pick. You can also put some extra money into a skill that you have already bought and after doing this a certain amount of times you can unlock them permanently. I will explain what I mean by that later when I talk about the levels. I'm getting close. If you don't want to die to get a new skill, you can also get some other upgrades at the shrine statues that are scattered around the levels. Most of the time they are in plain sight, but sometimes it can be hard to see them since they are hidden. They also refill your health, so make sure not to miss them. As you can see here in the shrine you can also pick some reward upgrades, some of them require you to be under a certain age number, others requires a certain amount of score that you have gained in the level, and others a certain amount of XP, however you must also be careful with which one you choose, since you can only pick one with each shrine that you find in the level. One of them that's very useful is the upgrade that reduces your death counter to zero. This will be very useful in the more difficult levels, though so it costs 1000 XP, which is a lot and that could go into a new skill, so it is your choice. The way you attack is like in a lot of these kind of action games. You use the joystick to point in the direction that you want to attack and you will have to get used to this, since there is no lock-on function. To defeat your enemies you have light and heavy attacks. Aside from the basic combos, you can also make different combinations to make new attack combos, 
and depending on the situations, some will be far better choice than others. Some combinations will require to also use the joystick as well, like the sweep attack that you can unlock. It is with down, up and finish with triangle. Then you will kick down the enemy, making them trip and fall, leaving them open to a few punches in the ground with circle. You don't need to change the direction of the combination depending on where you're facing the enemy, like in some other games like Devil May Cry. Your initial set of abilities might seem a bit limited, but once you unlock all the skills your moveset will become a lot more deep and varied. So make sure to practice a lot with them once you have all the skills permanently unlocked, to use them to their maximum potential. You also have a combination with X and a square that grabs enemies and throws them around. A good way to deal with them can be by throwing them into other enemies since this might interrupt the attacks. Throwing them into walls also works because it will deal extra damage and stagger them out for a moment. Throwing them off ledges or stairs can also be a good strategy since it does hurt them a lot. <laughs> and it's really funny to see them fall. Remember, enemies can do these same things to you, since you are also very weak to falling damage. So you will have to develop a special awareness and memorize the layout of every area of every level. <coughs> but that's very standard for this kind of games. One thing that is more unique is the way that you block, parry and avoid attacks. They are all done with L1. I know it sounds weird, but let me explain each one of them. Blocking it is done by holding L1. This will completely shield you from a normal enemy attack. However, you can't block forever, since you have a structure bar each time you successfully block an attack, this bar will increase, and when it reaches the maximum level, your block will break, leaving you wide open for more enemy attacks. <laughs> Because of this, it is almost always preferably and more efficient to do either an avoid or a parry rather than a block. Parry it is done by pressing L1, right when you are about to get hit by the attack. A successful parry will not only stop an enemy attack, but also leave them open for a counter attack, or throwing that enemy around in any direction. <laughs> A normal successful parry will also deal a lot of structure damage to that enemy. Avoid is quite complicated at first. It is done by holding L1, pointing the joystick down or up depending on the attack. Down is for direct attacks and up is for lower attacks, which can be confusing but you can get used to it after a while. You don't have to time it as precisely as a parry, with the moment the enemy attack hits you, but unlike a parry it will not stop the enemy, so if that enemy is doing a series of attacks, you must also make sure to avoid the attacks that come after the first one. <laughs> Avoids are especially useful against red glowing attacks that some enemies have, that deal too much structural damage to block. Ah! 
Some people might think that it would be easier if avoiding was done with a different button than blocking and parry, but that's not the point. You're supposed to choose between holding block to attempt avoids, and because of that, even if you fail the avoid, at least you will still block the attack. Meanwhile, if you attempt a parry, you will have to leave yourself open to attack since you have to time it correctly instead of holding block. That means if you fail the parry, you will most likely get hit, so there's a bigger risk about it. It allows the player to choose between mostly doing parries, avoids, or a mixture of both, to leave them with the option to choose their own playstyle. For example, at first I started trying to do parries, but I wasn't good enough at it, so I was getting hit too much. But then I learned how to do avoiding correctly, and from that point I decided to do mostly avoids, and it turned out to be a far more effective playstyle for me. Here you can see me doing some of the early arena challenges, and back then I was doing mostly parries, and while I was doing all right, I was still struggling far more than I should have. Here I am doing a far more advanced and difficult arena challenge, and by this point I had already decided to use far more avoids, and as you can see it really paid off, since I obviously couldn't have gotten this far if I had done my previous playstyle. Another of your abilities is the dodges, and it works like in most games. By pressing R2, your character will move out of the way. This is not as effective as avoids to deal with multiple attacks, but dodges are meant to be used to change your position in the arena. Also, by holding R2, you will run. This is good when you are getting too pressured by enemies and need to escape for a while to possibly use a different strategy or to find weapons. Next in the list of your set of abilities at your disposal to fight is the focus bar. You will fill it up by doing different actions. Once one bar is filled you can do a special attack by holding L2, then you will lock on a specific enemy with a wheel showcasing those attacks, so you can choose the one you want to use. By the way, this is the only way you can lock on and it only works with focus attacks. And since this is the only type of lock on in the game, it doesn't work quite well. Sometimes your character might aim to another enemy from the one that you actually wanted to hit. Because usually it prioritizes enemies that are attacking you or that are closer to you. And you can't cycle through targets by pressing a button. You start with only one bar as your limit, and with only one attack which is the eye strike. With it you will stagger the enemy for a while. It is useful but not that great. But luckily you can unlock more focus skills by buying them with your XP. One of them is the strong sweep, 
which is very useful for crowd control. It leaves your enemies lying in the ground for a while and most of the time it disarms them from whatever weapon they are carrying. Some of these focus skills need to focus bar to use it, but you can buy more in the shrine status. When activating the focus skills wheel, you will not pause the game entirely. Instead, you will slow down time and you can't attack until you choose a skill or go back to normal. Which means that if you take too long to choose a skill, you might get hit by an enemy. Another thing that's very important in every battle it is the takedowns. The very time that you manage to completely break an enemy's structure, they will stagger it for a while and open for you to do a takedown animation. With triangle and circle to instantly defeat them without having to deplete all their health. Also during them you will be invulnerable, so it is a good strategy to use them to save you from an upcoming enemy attack. Not only that, but beating an enemy with a takedown will give you some extra health recovery. You will also get a health bonus for beating an enemy the normal way, but with one of the shrine upgrades you can greatly increase the amount of health that you can gain with takedowns, meaning it is far more convenient to defeat enemies with takedowns than the normal way. The takedowns are a really big part of this game, and how you must play using them to your advantage. It is very similar to other games like Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal with the glory kills. These takedowns methods work great for gameplay as it rewards the skilled player for playing well. It also forces them to play aggressively up close and personal, because it makes it so the best strategy is to overwhelm the enemy with attacks to damage their structure and insta-defeat them. However, I always had a problem with them when it comes to weaker enemies. Lesser enemies in video games very rarely are a real threat to the player on their own. Usually they are meant to be more dangerous in groups, where they can surround you and put more pressure on you. But with this type of health reward takedowns, weaker enemies that were already not that much of a threat most of the time, now they are nothing more than just glorified recovery items. I shouldn't look at a very strong enemy that's alone and be like, damn, he's on his own. And when he is with a group of weak enemies, oh, thank god that he's not alone. Not to mention that it is very immersion breaking. Not only every time I do a takedown, all the other enemies stop their attacks to just look at how I'm beating one of the allies, but I also get extra health for no apparent reason at all. I know that the classic instant recovery by grabbing a health pack is not exactly realistic either, but at least there is some logic to it. And it is weird that the in-game combat tries to be so grounded and realistic. Hmm. Well, at least as realistic as a classic kung fu movie can be. Yet your character keeps gaining health after each enemy is defeated for no reason. Honestly, I think that Metal Gear Rising Revengeance did a better job with this method. Not only did they give a reason in the story to why Raiden was removing his enemies' his spines and covering himself with his uses for health, but they also made it so after slashing the enemy a few times, then you have to use blade mode and precisely cut the enemy in a specific point to remove the spine, meaning that it can still be a challenge to get help from a weaker enemy, especially if there are other enemies attacking you, since it is not that easy as just pressing two buttons. But on the other hand, this is clearly a more gameplay focused type of game so immersion is probably not the biggest priority for these developers. If the intention was to do what they thought was the best gameplay possible that they could do, then that's a good thing. And I think that in a lot of ways they succeeded in making a very challenging, fun game that forces you to play aggressively. So here you can see one of the arena challenges where the takedowns didn't refill any health at all making them less overpowered. It was certainly an interesting alternative way to see the takedowns function, and I am not saying that making the takedowns work like this in the entire game would make the game better, 
But I think it will be fascinating to see an alternative reality where the game was intended to work with this type of takedowns and health packs from the ground up. However, overusing takedowns in Sifu is not always a good thing. Sometimes in the story, a random henchman might survive the takedown and suddenly become far more powerful. Talk, this only happens with weaker enemies, and this only happens very rarely so it's not worth to stop using takedowns entirely just because of this. You will have just to use them less often. Like if an enemy is about to be defeated and you are at maximum health or just slightly damaged, then don't bother to use it. If it is already almost done anyways, just beat them the old fashioned way. Last thing that's worth mentioning is the fact that you can defend yourself by picking up weapons. This will deal more damage than your usual moveset, but they break after a while. They come in four types, bat slash pipes, bladed weapons, staff and other throwable objects. Each type of weapon comes with its own animations and movesets, but they have different amount of damage they can deal, reach and durability. For example, some bladed weapons have different modes of reach because they have a longer blade. Even though some weapons are exclusively to only be throwable, other weapons can be thrown. But unlike the focus attacks, these don't have a lock-on, so they are even less accurate. They usually work with an auto-aim and they still follow the rule of prioritizing nearby enemies or the ones that are currently attacking you. Pick up your weapon! But luckily you can also use the directional stick to choose the direction of the throwed object. Sadly it is not very precise since you don't have any feedback on what enemy you are aiming. Despite of this, throwing objects can be a good strategy to hit enemies from a distance and even stagger them for a while, though some of them don't do much damage and throwing a weapon will make it break much faster meaning that you can't spam too much throwing them at enemies. Some objects can only be kicked, which makes them slide through the ground, hitting the enemy in the legs making them fall. You can also unlock a skill to throw objects and weapons from the ground without having to pick them up first. There is a lot of weapon related skills, some of them need a specific weapon, like face smash in which you will use a bad type weapon to smash the face of the enemy. I pity you. Staggering them for a while, and deal a lot of damage and some others can be done with your bare hands without the need of a weapon. There is also the 360 swing, that's very useful since it can hit several enemies at the same time. Look Damn, we have been going on for a while now, and we haven't even talked about the levels, enemies and bosses yet. Ok, that's all that we got for today, guys. Hope that you enjoyed the video and if you did, please don't forget to share, like and subscribe. The rest will be done in part 2. See you later guys!